in two let in two letters written between the years 1964 and 1965, one to a newspaper correspondent and the other to an Anglican woman, the Trappist monk and author Father Mary Lewis Merton, better known to his reading public as Thomas Merton, ruminated about what and how he would have changed in his by then classic spiritual autobiography, The Seven Story Mountain, published some 16 years before. Merton contended that he would have said many things differently and that his thought at the time was hardly mature. Shortly before he died in 1968, Merton, writing to a high school student in California, noted that if he were to rewrite his most popular book and the work that had put him on the map as a spiritual voice to be reckoned with, he would have cut out a lot of the sermons and sales pitch for Catholic schools. And yet, as Merton scholar and past president of the International Thomas Merton Society, William H. Shannon points out in his literary critical biography of Merton entitled Something of a Rebel, the Seven Story Mountain has had ongoing appeal throughout the world right until today and has continued to play a major role in the conversion processes and vocational discernment experiences of men and women around the planet. Vivid and specific narrative recountings of his childhood and young adulthood, the personal sincerity and genuineness of the author, as well as the perennial human elements included in the book, give Merton's masterpiece its ongoing appeal. As early as 1951, the Seven Story Mountain had gone into its 254th printing. Monsignor Shannon's eight-page reader's guide to the seven-story mountain included in Something of a Rebel provides the first-time reader with a good overview and some helpful hints about hidden, lost, as well as some of the more obvious and traditional themes that support and serve as framework for this postmodern confessions. But one major theme that Shannon fails to note and that many Merton critics seem to neglect or ignore up until about a decade or so ago even though it is a seminal component throughout the rest of his writings, in his journals and letters included, right up until the time of his death, is Merton's ongoing concern with what historian Peter Lasselet has referred to as the world we have lost. That is to say, a world operating on a natural and balanced level, untrammeled and held captive by a technology and science which all but seem to have surpassed the control of its creators and finally, and very frighteningly, run amok. The young Thomas Merton's childhood experiences growing up on a still predominantly rural Long Island in New York, and you see him here looking out the back door of that house. His sojourns amongst French peasants while a boy accompanying his artist father on his painting expeditions through Europe. His confrontation with an increasingly frenetic technology, technologically advanced, albeit emotionally and spiritually bankrupt society, while a young man at Cambridge and Columbia universities, all culminate in his decision to enter what was still at the time a medievally structured Trappist monastery in rural Kentucky at the peak of the Second World War a time when a good part of the planet literally felt that the entire world was coming apart at the seams. The paradisical world of a garden wilderness, which was being subsumed and demolished by increasingly meaningless modes of materialism, genocidal nationalist bigotry, and means of warfare, the power of which humanity had only had nightmares about in the past, was regained by the new novice Mary Lewis Merton, upon his entry into the rigorously cloistered and liturgically rich life of Our Lady of Gethsemane Abbey. Merton's friends and associates who attended his solemn vows and ordination to the priesthood some five years after his entry noted during their celebratory conversations afterwards that the previously boisterous and unfocused rake who had been Tom Merton had literally blossomed and come into his own while living in a community where the inhabitants still grew their own food, made their own shoes, and arose in the middle of the night to chant psalms and sing hymns for sometimes as long as three hours at a shot. Before long, however, there was to be trouble in paradise. 
a not uncommon occurrence in supposedly paradisical settings in both modern and postmodern societies. But we will come to that issue in a few moments when we discuss Merton's understanding of and reaction to it in more detail. First, we should consider two important passages from the Seven Story Mountain that both foreshadow and summarize the themes of technology and its effects on the world and its varied inhabitants in the modern and postmodern age. Reviewing these incidents in the young Merton's life will also supply us with an example of a forceful juxtaposition of experiences which powerfully affected and influenced the boy and then young man who was Thomas Merton. The first experience is that of a 12-year-old spending the Christmas holidays of 1926 visiting his father in the village of Murat, located in the old Celtic province of the Auvergne. As Merton describes it in the Seven Story Mountain, this is a mountainous region of central France whose valleys are richly pastured and whose mountains heavy with fir trees or are covered with grass. The Auvergnats are traditionally scoffed at by the other French for their simplicity and rusticity and are, at least in Merton's estimation, very stolid but very good people. The village where the young Tom spent his holiday break was covered in snow that set off the gray and blue slate dark pattern of buildings grouped along three hillsides. His hosts, Monsieur and Madame Privat, were a typical Auvergnat couple, both no more than five feet tall. He broad-shouldered, a solid column of muscle and bone. She, thin, serious, earnest, and quick, with a traditional sugar loaf headdress perched on her head in seeming complement to her husband's black, broad-brimmed hat. What impressed itself upon the young Merton and all of what he stays with him over the next 15 years until he enters Gethsemane and comes to write his memoirs is this. I no longer possess any details about them. I just remember their kindness and goodness to me and their peacefulness and utter simplicity. They inspired real reverence, and I think, in a way, they were certainly saints. And they were saints in that most effective and telling way, sanctified by leading ordinary lives in a completely supernatural way, sanctified by obscurity, by usual skills, by common tasks, by routine. But skills, tasks, and routine, which received a supernatural form from grace within. Merton would later return to live with this couple and their family for a two-week period in the summer when they fed young Tom plenty of butter and milk and also nourished him with a supernatural love full of a delicate solicitude, which the young monk writer Merton is certain had an effect on his future conversion and vocation. The second incident we will consider comes some eight years after Merton's short sojourn in the natural paradise of the Auvergne, and finds him in what he describes as the dark, sinister atmosphere of Cambridge University. In fact, Cambridge is, in the metaphorical geography of the seven-story mountain, the lowest circle of hell. The institution and its people are like some kind of animal, which gores him so deeply that he felt that he would never recover entirely from the wound. Merton certainly had become a different person by the time he entered Clare College at Cambridge in the autumn of 1933. Almost all of his friends at university seemed to be those who had made it onto the proctor's books for the 101 university crimes that came under the general heading of conduct unbecoming of a gentleman. When he comes to write The Seven Story Mountain and ruminate on what exactly was wrong with Cambridge and the people who were there, why they were so empty inside, Merton relates the following incident. When I had been away from Cambridge for about a year, I heard what happened to a friend of mine. Mike was a beefy and red-faced and noisy youth and was uh, part of the crowd in which I milled around. He was full of loud laughter and a lot of well-meaning exclamations, and in his quieter moments he got into long and complicated sentences about life. But what was most characteristic of him was that he liked to put his fist through windows. He was the noisy and hearty type. He was altogether jolly. A great eater and drinker, he chased after girls with an astonishing heaviness of passion and emotion. He managed to get into a lot of trouble. 
After leaving Cambridge, I heard how he ended up. The porter or somebody went down into the showers under the buildings of the old port at Clare and found Mike hanging by his neck from a rope slung over one of the pipes with his big hearty face black with the agony of strangulation. He had hanged himself. All the important issues and images involving an ever more frenetic technological society and its insidious effects upon the natural world and those who populate it are in evidence here. And yet even Merton himself, at least at this point, never really emphasizes them or gives them their due. Furthermore, as Merton's biographer Benjamin Mott has pointed out, Merton never objectively tells the reader of the Seven Story Mountain just what that wound was that Cambridge and its inhabitants delivered to the young and ever more noticeably out of control Tom Merton. Merton's biographers and friends have suggested that Merton took part in a mock crucifixion scene while at Cambridge at what he referred to in veiled references thereafter as the party in the middle of the night. Supposedly the subject who was crucified was a very drunk and very confused Thomas Merton. Around the same time as the so-called party in the middle of the night Merton's great aunt Maud Pierce died and was buried at Ealing. Merton had used his uncle Ben's and aunt Maud's home as a base for a period just before and then immediately after his own father's untimely death. It is significant that this favorite and influential relative died right in the middle of Merton's Cambridge experience when every nerve and fiber of his being was laboring to enslave him in the bonds of what he called his own intolerable disgust. Aunt Maud was an emblem for Merton of an England different from the one that he was experiencing at Cambridge. She was warm, sensible, no-nonsense, and innocent of heart. She represented the other England, the England of the world we have lost, or at least was in the process of disappearing, the bucolic England of William Blake's green and pleasant land. Thus, when Maud comes to die, Merton notes in the Seven Story Mountain, at the funeral, they committed the thin body of my poor Victorian angel to the clay of Ealing and buried my childhood with her. Merton's search for this lost garden of Eden of his childhood, of that bucolic green and pleasant land of Blake's poetry, was at least partially achieved once he entered the cloistered grounds of Gethsemane Abbey. It is his life here at Gethsemane, which we will now trace in terms of the restoration of this garden, of the life lived therein, a life of the world we have lost. And we will observe it in terms of our themes for this conference, technology, ecology, and the monastic contemplative life. Indeed, in a very uncanny and frightening way, the loss of this world of closeness to nature, of living on equal terms with the creation, and a sense sometimes of powerlessness in trying to salvage it and retain it in the face of an ever more chaotic technological society which we ourselves have created, was repeated in the monastery confines within the first five years of Merton's monastic life. We have already noted the almost medieval quality of life at Gethsemane when Merton entered in December of 1941. Horses and plows were still employed by the monks to work the soil and harvest the crops. The monks themselves lived, there they are, uh, the monks themselves lived in open dormitories with no central heating and private spaces created with thin partitioning. They slept fully clothed in their habits on straw mattresses. Their meals, which were completely based on fresh vegetables and grains, were perhaps meager but all of the food was homegrown and freshly prepared. Work, most of which was manual labor in the forest or fields that surrounded the monastery, was plentiful even if the food was not. Cloister was rigorously observed. Monks lived, died, and were buried here with no coffin or embalming. This was indeed a very different environment from that of Cambridge University with its drunken revels. Yet Gethsemane is where Merton found his home for the next 27 years, and the importance of physical setting and place is something that cannot be exaggerated for Thomas Merton. Indeed, as William Shannon points out concerning the young novice's reaction to the monastic life, Merton loved every bit of it. 
He embraced the monastic discipline with the same enthusiasm as he had earlier thrown himself into the disordered, aimless pseudo-freedom of his youth. According to the 12th century mystical theologian Hugh of St. Victor, the recovery of Eden, whose very nature was unchangeable, was the aim of all human activity. This theme of monastic enclosures serving as paradisical gardens predates Hugh of St. Victor by almost a millennium and is found in early Desert Fathers' writings as well as in those of early Celtic monks and hermits. And it certainly is found throughout the Cistercian Fathers to which Merton was going to be exposed during his novitiate, uh, St. Bernard especially. The monastery of Gethsemane was to have been quite literally this unchanging garden, this walled paradise for Merton and for so many others who entered there and were formed with him. Any sense of the classically monastic notion of a contemptus mundi, of turning one's back on the world and society because it only distracts from the one sole goal of the monk, which is God alone, does not last for long once Merton is inside the cloister walls. His early journal entries at Gethsemane abound in descriptions of the natural life around him and how it caused him to rejoice in the larger geography of God's garden. The young brother Lewis writes, after standing in the cloister doorway watching the sunset one evening, I looked at all this in great tranquility with my soul and spirit quiet. For me, landscape seems to be important for contemplation. Anyway, I have no scruples about loving it. However, this place, which appeared to be so stable in the unstable world in 1941, was very quickly and disconcertingly about to undergo significant and, for many of its inhabitants, disturbing changes within the first decades of Merton's life here. Along with the changes affected by 1951, a second wave of transformation, with buildings disappearing or others being gutted and alter, altered, has made it difficult to trace Merton's steps around the monastery environs as recorded in the Seven Story Mountain or in the Sign of Jonas. Although monasticism as lived at Gethsemane in the 1940s was far from perfect, the monks there experienced a simple and good life with most of the confreres living to an age far beyond the national average. It was truly a communal or communistic ethic that was being lived out here in reality, from each according to his capacity to each according to his needs. Thus the transformations which characterized the 1950s, greatly disturbing this equilibrium of capacity and needs, created a new restlessness and anxiety in Merton, which the Gethsemane of 1941 had not only assuaged, but had served as a catalyst to transform the young monk into a new man who had blossomed and grown into an ever more integrated and balanced human person. Merton, both at the time and in retrospect, would refer to these years as an Edenic period in his own life, as well as in that of the community of Gethsemane. The changes commenced with the election of both a new abbot general of the Trappist order in France and of a new abbot at Gethsemane. This latter figure, Dame jo da Dom James Fox, was a graduate of Harvard Business School and something of a prodigy in his field of expertise. He inherited a monastery that had survived on the heritage of its Alsatian French founders for almost a hundred years, with little or no changes being made in its internal spiritual or external material existence. The result was that by the early 1950s, the monastery buildings desperately needed repair, especially with over 100 monks to house and feed in residence. And the monastery economy desperately needed immediate attention, with the community being some $20,000 in debt. Dame J Dom James, it seemed clear to everyone in the community, including Merton, was the man to make the needed changes. But were the compromises to the monastic life as it had been lived at Gethsemane for almost 100 years going to be worth it in the long run? Perhaps one could only answer that question with hindsight. However, for Merton, and for a few others within the community, the consequences, many of them perhaps of a tragic and even catastrophic nature, were all too clearly evident from very soon after the initiation of Dom James's reform. The monastery needed to work on an ever more efficient basis, thus it needed to commit itself to greater activity. 
Perhaps most significant was Dom James's decision to disband the old medieval means of living self-sufficiently and instituting an active embracing of modern mechanized methods of farming and processing foods for personal consumption and commercial sale. The changes in a paradoxical way paid off, with wave after wave of novices applying for entrance to the cloister. So many, in fact, that there was no room in the dormitories for them to sleep, and so pup tents were set up in the cloister garden for occupation. In Merton's estimation, at least, and this is true for Thomas Merton and a few others, I've been talking to some of the monks in the last couple of days, and the situation is a lot more complex than just saying that it was mechanization that caused uh, novices eventually to start leaving. Uh, but for Merton, at least, this was one of the problems uh, extant. The sudden growth was indeed paradoxical, since once the men had arrived and got a sample of the radical changes that were occurring at the abbey and witnessed the rapidly deteriorating system of socio-pastoral structures and spiritual symbols which were disappearing while the economic life of the now mechanized abbey boomed and bustled, these very same vocations proceeded to leave in a steady exodus. As Benjamin Mott notes, the monastery had become not only one of economic soundness, but one of actual financial prosperity. Yet, like most financial achievements, this had costs which did not show up on the balance sheets. Some of the results of the changes were both spiritually and physically damaging. The achievement was an astonishing one, so much so that it tended to blind others. Merton, disturbed by the level of noise in and around the cloister, brought on by the new heavy machinery in use, and furthermore by the fact that his own growing fame as an author was bringing in the needed cash with which to purchase the new jeeps, tractors, bulldozers, and combines, saw the cost of the community and recognized that it was much more than that his own personal idol had been shattered. Not only was Merton concerned by the shift to big business that was characterized by the monastery's new food po uh, processing corporation of Gethsemane Farms, uh, which produced and marketed cheese, bread, bacon, and the breeding of Belgian mares, uh, but he was equally disturbed by the new uh, methods of farming employed on the monastery farm proper. Insecticides and chemicals used by the monks seemed to give the crops a forced color. This bothered Merton, as did the increasing number of dead birds that he found on the property while taking hikes through the woods. In response to these occurrences, Merton wrote to Rachel Carson in January of 1962, and even managed to have her ecologically provoking work, Silent Spring, read in the monastic refectory. The book was withdrawn, however, when the cellarer took issue with some of the figures and statistics which Carson quoted in her text. Merton's letter to Carson, which he marked for inclusion as an appendix to his so-called Cold War letters, succinctly summarizes the situation as Merton saw it and served as a springboard for the many other reflections on technology and ecology that would weave themselves in and out of his writings over the next six years. First of all, he notes that there is a strange and perplexing paradoxical contradiction seemingly inherent in the interrelationships of technology and ecology. There is the same mental process involved, Merton notes to Carson, that he almost had written mental illnesses here instead of mental processes, in the human person's irresponsible propensity to scorn the smallest values while daring to use our titanic power in a way that threatens not only civilization, but life itself. This vicious circle of suicidal actions is repeated in our very attempts to cure the illness. It seems that our remedies are instinctively those which aggravate the sickness. The remedies are expressions of the sickness itself. There is a type of death wish built right into humankind's most fundamental being. Merton compares it to the Christian concept of original sin, but notes that no matter what one's dogmatic convictions, human, humans almost universally possess a tendency to destroy and negate themselves just when everything is at its best, and that it is just when things are paradisical that we use our technological powers in a horrifyingly destructive manner. Thus, 
There is a hatred of life lurking right under the surface of our optimism about ourselves and about our affluent society. But the economics, culture, philosophy of affluence is itself so self-defeating, contains so many built-in frustrations of its own, that it inevitably leads us to despair. The awful fruit of this despair is even more indiscriminate, irresponsible destructiveness and hatred of life, to the point that in order to survive, we instinctively destroy that on which our survival depends. Furthermore, this destructive activity not only savages the natural resources of the world around us, it also eradicates the religious, spiritual systems that have for thousands of years assisted humans in maintaining a healthy balance between themselves and the planet on which they live. In the words of Donald P. Sinjin, the technological system that has shattered nature's system of checks and balances and promised godlike powers to humans has simultaneously eroded cultural systems which generate virtues and a perennial wisdom that attempted to guard humanity from its own excesses. The appeal to a sapiential way of knowing and behaving is of crucial importance here as Merton shifts his discussion to an intentionally theological one, familiar ground for the seasoned monk in his cloistered paradise. To religious thinkers and sages, Merton notes to Carson, the world has always appeared as a transparent manifestation of the love of God, of a paradise of his wisdom, manifested in all his creatures and in the most wonderful interrelationship between them. Merton now proposes what, in terms of Christian theology at least, has been dubbed the stewardship model of human rest of created being interrelationship. Humankind's vocation within the context of the cosmic creation is to be as an eye to the rest of the body. There is a delicate balance to maintain here, however, and humans must understand their position as one of profound responsibility, using nature wisely, ultimately relating himself and visible nature to the invisible, to the source and exemplar of all being and all life. It should come as no surprise to us, however, that Merton was not naive about humans' failure to take on this responsibility, supported by both an ecological and a cosmic wisdom. Indeed, the modern reluctance to accept such a simple yet sublime vocation is an essential piece to the puzzle of our violent and destructive behavior towards the creation. But humans have been blinded into thinking that they do see all the better because they have acquired so much technological know-how and power over the elements. And the blindness has led to the loss of our sense of wisdom and cosmic perspective. The stewardship model of ecological harmony and protection, no matter how well-intentioned and theologically well-grounded, does not always, perhaps even rarely, work in the cold reality of postmodern technological society. As environmentalist William Schlesinger has so aptly stated, dominion over the earth in Genesis didn't mean to leave this pillaged and smoking. Nevertheless, the seemingly innate desire of humans to torch the very thing which sustains them and with which they need to cooperate in order to live integrally always seems to supersede the wise and cosmic perspective. Merton concludes his theological exposition by noting that technics and wisdom are not by any means opposed. On the contrary, the duty of our age the vocation of modern man is to unite them in a supreme humility which will result in a totally self-forgetful creative and service. He then poses the $10 million rhetorical question, can we do this? And then he speculates that certainly we are not moving in the right direction. Three years after his letter to Carson, Merton ruminated at length in conjectures of a guilty bystander about the profound dilemma modern man was facing in terms of technological development in the face of an ever more pronounced ecological and sociological disintegration. This remains perhaps the most developed commentary on these themes supplied by Merton in one place. For Merton, technological, technology is falsely seen by most of society to be the highest development of man, auguring a golden age of plenty and perfect freedom. 
The technological achievements of modern man are indeed astonishing and magnificent. On the other hand, viewed from the context of their unbalance with the other aspects of human existence in the world, they are components of disintegration. Too much power in the hands of humans only leads to the abuse of that power at the expense of wisdom, prudence, and temperance. What difference does technological advancement make if the men and women in the society which possesses them are still frustrated, bored, suicidal, and megalomaniacal? He concludes, It does us no good to make fanatic progress if we do not know how to live with it, if we cannot make good use of it, and if, in fact, our technology becomes nothing more than an expensive and complicated way of cultural disintegration. It is bad form to say such things, to recognize such possibilities, but they are possibilities, and they are not often intelligently taken into account. People get emotional about them from time to time, and then sweep them away into forgetfulness. The fact remains that we have created for ourselves a culture which is not yet livable for mankind as a whole. In fact, the existence of a humanity ever more dependent on an emancipated technology for its necessities and its pleasures is one of moral infancy in total dependence not on Mother Nature, such a dependence would be partly tolerable and human, but on pseudo-nature, on the pseudo-nature of technology. The subsequent illusion that mechanical progress means human improvement is what ultimately alienates humans from their own being and their own reality. He says, It is precisely because we are convinced that mechanical progress means human improvement that alienates us from our own being and our own reality. It is precisely because we are convinced that our life is better if we have a better car, better TV set, and better toothpaste that we contemn and destroy our own reality and the reality of our natural resources. Technology was made for man, not man for technology. In losing touch with being with God, we have fallen into a senseless idolatry of production and consumption for their own sakes. We have renounced the act of being and plunged ourselves into process for its own sake. We no longer know how to live, and because we cannot accept life in its reality, life ceases to be a joy and becomes an affliction. And we even go so far as to blame it all on God. Merton contrasts this equation of technology equals manipulation of the creative world equals progress equals happiness to what instead should be an openness and a respect for the created world as God has given it to us. This respect and openness must be grounded in a real intuition of the act of being, coupled with a gratefulness for and a contemplative perception of that being. If this is not the case, Merton warns, then we can look forward to further destruction and debasement of the world in the name of a false humanism which has no other fruit than to make man hate himself, hate life, and hate the world he lives in. The material included in Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander, however, is not Merton's final word on the topic of technology and the ecology. That is to be found in an occasional piece written for Center Magazine in July of 1968, five months before his untimely death in Bangkok. One would be hard-pressed to call this Merton's mature thought on the themes we have been discussing here tonight, but it does demonstrate that Merton was far from finished with the matter, and that some of his original propositions had changed and developed in the years since his letter to Rachel Carson. In what is ostensibly a review of Roderick Nash's book, Wilderness and the American Mind, Merton delves more deeply than ever before into the questions of technological society and ecology and religions, and most especially a contemplative religion's role in the uniting and balancing of these two elements. Merton begins his essay by once again noting the strange paradoxical nature of humanity's current situation in a highly advanced technological society of affluence and unsurpassed power and control over its surroundings. It is an ambivalent culture full of self-contradictions, especially in its treatment of the wild. We confess our firm attachment to values that inexorably demand 
the destruction of the last remnant of wildness, he says. But when someone suggests that this contradiction is itself an indication of a sickness in ourselves, we dismiss them as fanatics. This, this sickness, Merton boldly states, is rooted in our biblical Judeo-Christian tradition, which he immediately notes is neither truly biblical, nor Jewish, nor Christian. Nevertheless, there is a nominally Christian approach to the world that, at a deep and perhaps unconscious level, is dualist in its metaphysics, and as a result, profoundly destructive of nature and of God's good creation. Developing from their original Puritan forefathers' repugnance for spontaneity, and so in turn for nature and the wild, the contemporary American capitalist culture finds itself rooted in a secularized Christian myth and mystique of struggle with nature. The ambivalence continues with a second mystique layered on top of the first, this one being the cult of America the beautiful. America which must be kept lovely, so don't throw that beer can in the river, even though the water is polluted with all kinds of industrial waste. Business can mess up nature, but not you, Jack. Henry David Thoreau, one of Merton's favorite authors on the topics at hand, along with the transcendentalists, offer a more realistic and truthful assessment of the situation. But even their work is quickly turned into cliché-ridden propaganda by the powers that be. Yet Merton does make particular note of Thoreau's belief that humans need wildness to balance out their more civilizing tendencies, lest their propensity to subject everything to rational and conscious control should warp, diminish, and barbarize them. Ultimately, Merton holds up Aldo Leopold and his now classic book, A Sand County Almanac, as perhaps the best example of how we should approach the current conundrums of technology and ecology. Calling it one of the most important moral discoveries of our time, Merton cites Leopold's ecological conscience as being centered in an awareness of man's true place as a dependent member of the biotic community. Leopold's rule of thumb ecological principle is that a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. Merton claims that in light of this principle, an examination of our social, economic, and political history in the last hundred years would be a moral nightmare, redeemed only by a few gestures of goodwill on the part of those who obscurely realize that there is a problem. Compared to the magnitude of the problem, their efforts are at best pitiful. What is more, the old monster of self-contradicting hypocrisy rears its head again in that those who continue to rape nature simultaneously honor the wilderness myth with the same gestures and great earnestness of an Aldo Leopold or a Henry David Thoreau. Merton then re-asks the same question he had placed before Rachel Carson in 1962. Can Leopold's ecological conscience become effective in America today? Globally, he says, the situation looks bleak. Merton allows, especially when one considers that an ecological conscience should be tantamount to a peacemaking conscience. And with the stark examples of crop poisoning, defoliation of forest trees, and the incineration of villages and their inhabitants with napalm ever before his eyes, Merton does not hold much cause for hope. Acting locally may be the best we can hope for, and at least in terms of his essay, wearing a little yellow and red button that proclaims celebrate life and bearing witness to this exhortation is perhaps the best we can do given the present circumstances. These are not the most promising of parting words from Merton on this matter. Up until the composition of this essay, he had always seen the monastery and the witness of the contemplative and sapiential life lived therein as one of the most important and effective means of combating the technological onslaught. The goal of the contemplative is, on its lowest level, the recognition of the splendor of being and unity, a splendor in which he is one with all that is. Science and technology are admirable in many respects, 
but they can never solve humanity's deepest problems. Without wisdom, they can only precipitate him still further into the centrifugal flight that flings him into the darkness of outer space. Already by the time of conjectures of a guilty bystander, Merton had become deeply worried that monastic institutions were having their mission and effectiveness weakened by the adoption of modern production technologies. If the cloister was to be a continual foretaste of paradise until Christ's second coming, then it is our duty to continue the work of paradise by tending the garden. For the garden, the wilderness, is essential for contemplation. Or in the words of P.F. O'Connell, the work of paradise is the protection of creation. As Merton was to conclude in his long essay, Wilderness and Paradise, written in 1967, if the monk is a man whose whole life is built around a deeply religious appreciation of his call to wilderness and paradise, and if technological society is constantly encroaching upon and destroying the remaining wildernesses which it nevertheless needs, in order to remain human, then we might suggest that the monk, of all people, should be anxious to preserve the wilderness in order to share it with those who need to come out from the cities and remember what it is like to be under trees and to climb mountains. Finally, Merton expressed in no uncertain terms his continuing concern with monasticism's ability to confront the conundrums of postmodern society during an informal talk delivered in Calcutta a few weeks before his untimely death in Bangkok. In the West, there is now going on a great upheaval in monasticism, and much that is of undying value is being thrown away irresponsibly, foolishly, in favor of things that are superficial and showy, that have no ultimate value. I will say as a brother monk from the West to Eastern monks, the time is coming when you may face the same situation, and your ancient traditions will stand you in good stead. Perhaps most alarmingly, however, is a marginal note left in one of Merton's last working notebooks kept while at his hermitage here at Gethsemane. Where's my arrow? Perhaps, okay, in this same notebook, Merton made his initial notations for what would become his article, The Wild Places. The dreadful fact is that I was born into this world at the very moment when the whole thing came to a head. And it is precisely in my lifetime that civilization has undergone this massive attack from within itself. My whole life is shaped by this, and it presses on the brain with a near darkness. Forty years after recording this observation, Forty years after Merton's accidental death while visiting with monastic men and women from around the world, the dreadful fact of this massive attack continues to press in on our brains with ever-increasing darkness. Merton, and I think most of us here would agree, at least in part, had diagnosed the dilemma accurately and insightfully. He also sensed very deeply the almost desperate circumstances in which the technological, ecological crisis was and would continue to be played out. There are no real solid programs or tactics for action that he suggested. Perhaps he would have come to suggest something once he returned to Gethsemane from the east. We will never know. It is, I suspect, the hope of everyone gathered here for these days of listening and sharing that further consciousness raising will occur, but also that we may discern some sort of preliminary steps towards action, whether local or global, personal or communal, that we can begin to take in our own daily lives. Some of the most fundamental and perhaps the most effective of these actions is, for us monks and contemplatives gathered here, already obvious. I would like to give the final word this evening not to Thomas Merton, but to another brother monk, Father Bruno Barnhart, a Camaldolese Benedictine of Big Sur, California. In his recent book, The Future of Wisdom, Toward a Rebirth of Sapiential Christianity, Father Bruno sums up the life and work of Thomas Merton in this way. Roughly during the last decade of his life, Merton began to move back toward the modern world, which he had left behind 
particularly those thinkers and writers with whom he felt a great affinity. He was moving further into the country of imagination and at the same time apparently discovering the wide ecumenical territory of the sapiential in which he was able to rediscover everything that he loved. The sapiential world, in the new sense in which he was coming to conceive it, included the mystery of Christ and the archetypal contemplative East, but it also included everything of value that had been left outside the walls of his earlier theological enclosure and labeled toxic, secular. Merton was awakening to a new Christian wisdom in which the imminent force of incarnation has awakened divinity within the human person in the active, creative mode. Gradually, the early Merton's Catholic and monastic triumphalism gives way to a more sober experience of the life of faith and a deeper awareness of solidarity in the human condition. This is the threshold of post-modernity, of the post-Western mind, of global consciousness and global participation at every level. It is Thomas Merton's exhortation to those of us gathered here this week to meet the sometimes horrific challenges of, but at the same time to make fruitful use of, the unique situations that constitute our postmodern world. This is a call to journey into that wide ecumenical territory of the imagination and the sapiential, to tap into the divine within each of us, allowing for an ever more profound sense of solidarity in the human condition, to recall, reinforce, and revive our own ancient traditions which will stand us in good stead as things around us grow ever more bizarre, to put on a global mind of participation at every level before it is too late and the darkness has covered us completely.